Good afternoon, everyone, or morning or evening, depending on where you're watching us from. I know we have a few people from Australia where it's very early in the morning. So I thank everybody for being here today. I know we're getting close to the holiday time and people are busy. Um, so I appreciate your taking the time to be with me. We are on a different day than usual. Um, usually we do Tuesdays, but I have a uh, camera club seminars tomorrow and uh, judging on Wednesday. So it was a busy week for me, um, but I wanted to get this one in before we got too close to the holidays. So anyway, today's program, I'm going to show some of the projects we've done throughout the year. I've been doing these webinars since February. This is my 10th one of the year. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to show you a new project and I'm going to go over some of the new features of the Luminar AI, which is releasing tomorrow. If you pre-ordered it, you may have already gotten your copy because they did start sending um, the links out last week, the end of last week. Um, but everybody will have it by tomorrow. And if you haven't ordered it yet and you want to try it out, even if you pre-ordered or if you order it, you know, after tomorrow, they do have a 30-day money back guarantee. So if you decide you don't like it um, for whatever reason, you can request your money back. Um, but also as of tomorrow, my affiliate discount code will be reactivated during the pre-sale period because they had some really good pricing. They, um, our affiliate links worked, but our extra $10 discount did not. But starting tomorrow, that will be reactivated. So you can save an extra 10 bucks off of the pricing as of tomorrow. Alrighty, so I'm going to get rolling. And if you can stay with me a little bit longer today, I am pretty positive this is going to go past an hour. I have a lot of things I want to show you. Um, and at the end, I am going to announce we're having a year-end blowout sale um, with 40% off everything. And I'll give you the code for that at the end. And um, um, and we'll take that from there. So let me get rolling. Oh, the other thing we're going to do differently today is I'm going to hold questions till the end because I do have so many things to cover. Um, so I will um, discard that. So I will um, be holding questions until the end of the session. And then whatever I, if I don't get to answer it today, then I also, um, like I usually do, will answer some more in Thursday's uh, blog post. And I'm adjusting my microphone because some people are saying their voice is going in and out. I've got it pretty much almost up to my mouth, so hopefully that's better. It could be because I'm turning my head, even though I have a headset on. Alrighty, so this is our first project, and this one is from the first webinar I did back in February. And I don't know about you, but I just, something about bare trees or sometimes dead trees, but this one wasn't, it was just a very bare tree. Um, I don't know, I just like their silhouettes, especially against the sky. But this day it was kind of an overcast day, not a very interesting sky. So we're going to do some stuff to jazz this up. So I always start by duplicating my background layer and I use the keyboard shortcut Control J. And the first thing I want to do here is I'm going to go into my Topaz Studio and do my AI Clear, which I love and I still use pretty much on every image. Um, and that does clarity, um, detail, and denoise all at one shot. So we're going to go to Add Filter and I select the AI Clear. And probably 99% of the time I don't change any of these sliders. This blue bar is the progress bar. And then to save time, instead of going, usually I would accept this, go back to Photoshop, duplicate the layer, come back to Topaz. But just in the essence of time today, I'm going to go ahead and add a look on top of this. Looks are what used to be called presets. And since I know the name of what I want, I'm going to just change that to all. And I'm going to use the search bar. And I'm going to use dramatic HDR. Of course, you have to be able to type correctly. And here it is right here. I just got to give it time to load. And come on, catch up. Takes a little time. All right, there we go. So I'm going to hit apply to add that. Pre
increase that to my image. And then if you wanted to go into any of the components that create that preset, that would be contrast, a vignette, or a basic adjustment, you could change those. But I like the way this looks. It really jazzed up the sky quite a bit and brought out some more detail in the image. So I'm going to go back to my Photoshop. I'm just going to click on Accept. And we'll have both of those things added in here. And then I'm going to add a new blank layer. And I don't know if you know this, but if you're doing healing and cloning, you can do them on a separate layer. And the reason for that is you are then not changing the pixels of your image. You're just, you're doing the process on a separate layer. You just have to make sure, I'm gonna select the healing tool, that at the top sample all layers is checked because there's nothing on this layer. So it needs to see the layer below it. And then you can, in this case, I went through and cloned out all of the um, power lines. And I'm not going to take the time to do all of these right now. And again, all of this stuff that I'm doing today is available in the notes. And I'm going to switch over to, to the um, clone tool. And um, the notes are available for just $5 in the Peacock Studio. And today, I added a bonus set of textures to, um, to the notes as well. And that did not work well. Um, so you get six extra textures for free along with the notes because you get the images, the notes, and the textures that I use as well as the notes for the session. So I would go through and take the time to clone all of these out, but again, because I want to cover a lot today, that's not as important to our image. So I'm not going to finish that right now. And then because I did these on a separate layer, I want to bring in a texture and I want that to see this complete image. So I like to work with a merge layer rather than flattening my file so I can keep these layers. I'm going to create a layer above this that contains everything without flattening my file. And I do that with the keyboard shortcut, Control, Alt, Shift, E on a PC. On a Mac, it would be Command, Option, Shift, E. So, and I always rename this merged so I can remember why that layer is there. And then I am going to bring in my first texture. I'm going to apply two of my Cosmos textures. And I'm working with two monitors, if you haven't seen me do this before. So I tend to drag my textures from the other monitor. Um, and I'm just going to do that right now by bringing it in. And I'll show you how you can do that if you don't have two monitors as well. And I decided I wanted to rotate this so the green was at the bottom. And you can either do that by just grabbing um, the corner. If you'd put your cursor outside any of the corners, it turns into the curved arrow. And then just click hold and drag. And when you get close to square, if you hold the shift key, it'll make it pop into a perfect square. And then I'm just going to stretch this out to cover my layer. And either hit enter or the check mark at the top. And then working with textures, it's all about our blending modes and opacities. So for this one, I'm going to change it to multiply, which is a darkening mode, and lower the opacity to about 82%. And then I decided it was too green on the grass. So I'm going to add a layer mask to this layer. And I'm going to grab a soft round brush, which I am on. My foreground color is black. I'm going to make my brush bigger. And the opacity of my brush is at about 64%, which is fine, because then it won't take all of the texture off at once if I decide I want to leave a little bit. And I'm just going to brush across this grass and take some of that bright green off. And I'm going to take most of the texture off. And you can see here where I've masked. Okay, I missed a piece in the middle. All right, I'm going to bring in one more texture. This is another Cosmos. It's a lighter blue. Slide this over here and stretch it out to cover our image. Accept it. 
This I'm also going to use blend, uh, blending mode of multiply and bring down the opacity to about 48%. And then I want to duplicate this layer mask on this layer. So rather than adding a mask and recreating it, I'm just going to hold, select this mask and hold the Alt key and drag it to this layer and it duplicates that exact mask. So you don't have to recreate it. It's really handy, especially if you have something really detailed. This particular one, it wouldn't have been that hard to just remask it, but sometimes you've done a very intricate mask and that's a great way to just um, duplicate it. So on a um, PC that's holding the Alt key, and it would be option on a Mac. Yes, dear. There's a question about using iPads that they can't use it. Um, somebody's having a question about using an iPad. These do not work on an iPad. You can't do Photoshop, not full Photoshop on an iPad and most of these, um, I really haven't done that much with Photoshop on my iPad, but most of these techniques I don't believe will work on an iPad. Um, so, um, to watching it, yes, you can watch the webinar on an iPad. You just have to have Zoom installed. Okay, so we're going to go on to our next project. I'm going to open up my next image. And this is a truck from a, um, a farm near here. It's called Amy's Mill. Um, even though it's A-M-I-S, it's um, a French name and it's pronounced Amy. And it um, goes back to the 1700s. Um, we are one of the oldest areas in Tennessee. Actually, the town we live in where this is also located is the second oldest town in Tennessee. So that's a pretty cool fact. There's lots of history around here. Um, and the fifth generation granddaughter and her husband now own this farm and run the restaurant. That is part of it. So that's a pretty cool thing. Alrighty. So for this one, I've duplicated my background layer. <clears throat> I'm going to start with my Topaz. And this one was from webinar number five, if you have those notes already. And we're going to do our filter and yeah, clear. We're going to wait for that to finish. And then we're going to add another filter and do precision detail. I like to use this when I want to bring out even a little bit more detail than the AI clear did. And I usually just use it on the small and medium detail, usually somewhere between 10 and 20 percent. Um, and just bring these up a little and just bring a little more detail to our subject. Let's accept that and go back to Photoshop. And we're going to duplicate this layer. And now I'm going to go into, when I first did this product, of course, Luminar AI was not even on the radar yet. So I'm going to do this in Luminar 4 the way I did the first time. Um, so we're going to go into Skylum into Luminar 4. And if you have Luminar 4, it is going to still continue working. Um, they've promised to do upgrades and keep it up to date until at least the end of next year, possibly beyond, but they've guaranteed at least that. Um, and you can continue to use it for as long as it's compatible with software and operating systems. As we know, every time our computers have a new operating system, some software has trouble with that until it gets updated. Okay, so in here, I clicked on this tab for looks. And this opens up a film set of presets, film strip, I'm oh, sorry, of presets. And the one that I decided I liked, they have different categories. I think it was under here. Nope, you gotta find, the one I want is morning fog. Let's try the landscape. There it is. Under morning fog is under our landscape category. And I was looking to just do something to get this a little more vintagey looking. And I thought that worked pretty well. And then once you're in here and you've done that preset, you can go ahead and adjust things further. And I went down to this pro tab. These are the four categories 
um, which are the same in AI. So you have essentials, creative, portrait, and professional. And in the pro, there are some photo filter effects that are really cool, just like using filters on your camera. And I'm gonna click on here and I went to amount 14 and the hue I changed to 72 just to give it a little more faded look. And then we're gonna hit apply and that will send us back to Photoshop. Both of the Luminar products as well as Topaz Studio can be used as standalones as well as plugins. I like to start in Photoshop so I have everything on separate layers and I can just kind of see how it goes. Um, if I want to delete something, it's easy enough to delete the layer instead of going back. Um, that's my personal preference. You, you know, obviously can do it whichever way works best for your workflow. So I'm going to add a couple of textures to this one. And let me show you quickly, if you don't have two screens and you can't see the texture you want, you're just going to go to File, Open, and I suggest um, keeping your textures in a specific folder and then having subfolders that you can find them in. For today, I have everything for this webinar lined up and ready to go. And the texture I want to use first is the soft colors. So you would just open that texture and it would open as a separate file. So we have our truck, we have our colors. You're going to take your move tool. If you're in Photoshop CC or any of the Photoshop versions, you're going to click that tab and pull down so that you can see them side by side. And then click anywhere in the texture, click, hold, and drag on top of your image. Um, if you have Photoshop Elements, you would have both of them open in your um, photo bin and you can drag from there. So the same type of process, you'll just have them in a different location. So that is our texture. And I also wanted to rotate this one because I wanted this darker blue at the bottom and the lighter color at the top. So besides using the cursor, you can also go over to Edit, Transform, and then Rotate 180. So you can either use the menu or the cursor, whichever you prefer. We're going to change this blending mode to soft light and the opacity about 77. Alrighty, and then we're going to bring in another texture. I'm going to drag them in just because it's quicker. And we're going to line this one up. And these are all textures available in my online store. Um, this is the alcohol inks. And we're going to also change this one to soft light. And opacity about 42, 43, close enough. And then we're going to add a frame to this. Um, I have sets of brushes that also come as PNG files. You can use them either as a brush or as this is the PNG version, which means the PNG means it has a transparent background. So in here, there's a lot of transparent area. And what I want to do with this one, I wanted to do this something more irregular than just a vignette. Um, I want to change this to white instead of black. So I'm going to set my foreground color to white. And there are two ways you can change the color of this on this layer quickly. <clears throat> because we want to keep our transparent pixels transparent. We only want the color to be where there is already color. So you can either, first I have to change this to a rasterize. When you drag it in, it becomes a smart object. So I just had to rasterize that. So this would work. You can either hit this lock button and that will lock the transparent pixels. And then you can use the keyboard shortcut Alt Backspace to change it to white on a Mac, that would be Option plus Delete. The other way you can do it is without the lock button, you can just hold down the Shift key when you hit the Alt Backspace, and that will also lock those transparent background, um, transparent pixels. Um, so we can see we now have a white border. And now I want to change this to, I'm going to leave the blending mode at normal. I'm just going to bring the opacity down 
to about 55%, just to make it a little more transparent, because I didn't want it to be completely white. I wanted just a lighter edge to it. One last texture. And brown tones like this tend to warm up an image, which is what I was going for at this point. And this we're going to do soft light again and bring it down to 60%. And there you have it. Um, I had a canvas printed of this that looks really nice. I actually just had a second one done I'm going to give to the restaurant with another um, image I did of their, one of the other buildings there. So that will be uh, something nice for them to hang up. So that is the end of that project. So let's close this one. And next we're going to do, this is um, from the dogwoods at on the Roaring Fork Trail in the Smoky Mountain National Park. So this was my original image, not much of an image. And this is what I love to take something that's like, you know, what I call the ho-hum to a work of art. So this was a really kind of a blah image. Um, I didn't like these big tree trunks coming through it, but I love the bokeh that I got in the background from the, the highlights. So the first thing I did was crop this image and I have that already prepared. So I'm going to bring that in. So this is how I cropped it. So I got rid of most of that dark tree. There's a little bit here and we're going to get rid of that in a second. Um, duplicate our background layer. And the first thing I wanted to do was to get rid of this and um, I'm actually going to get rid of this flower up here and I'm going to show you a quick way to do that. So I did do a little bit of healing on the petals to, um, you know, get rid of some of these little brown spots that was kind of getting toward the end of its uh, life here and starting to fade a little. So you can clean up little things like that. And that will do for the moment. You can, obviously you'll be much more careful, you know, when you're doing this on your own image or if you want to get the notes and practice along. Um, this was from our fourth webinar, by the way. And then to get rid of this flower up here, there's a couple ways that are kind of cool tricks to um, get rid of things like this. I'm going to add a blank layer. And I'm actually going to paint out some of this because it was such a large area. So I'm going to grab my paintbrush and with my foreground, I just selected a color near this and I have the number written down so I could replicate it. So I'm going to just type it in 98055. So you can see I kind of took this greenish color in here. And then I put the opacity of the brush very low at about 25% because I didn't want to just totally overpower the whole thing. And the flow I also brought down to about there. And then I'm just going to paint some of this. And I might, let's go up a little bit on the opacity so that we can get through it a little quicker. And you could just paint over this and you could go over it a couple times and change the brush color to match each area. And it's a little bit easier than trying to clone out all of that. And then you can click the brush, pick a color like this kind of a little bit lighter color and then do some in here. So it's kind of a cool way to uh, kind of cheat a little <laughs> and get this done quicker. And then kind of blend it out like that. And then I lowered the opacity way down and just kind of did a little bit to make it blend a little better like that so it looks more natural and you could kind of like that and then down in this area I did the same thing with a different color we used 828765 and kind of did the same thing just um let's move this back up some so you can play around with the opacities as you start painting 
And here, I just really wanted to get rid of that dark spot because that was kind of annoying. And then bring it down a little bit and just blend it in. That works. That's a lot more tight. And you could really get rid of that one if you wanted to, but that one didn't bother me so much when the project was done. As when I had done it the first time, I really didn't like those. Alrighty, so that's that part. So now I'm going to do one of my merged layers because when I'm going to take this into Topaz and I need it to see everything. If I took it into Topaz now, it would only see that one layer. So the Control Alt Shift E, and then we'll duplicate that. And the reason I duplicate is if I decide I don't like what I did in Topaz, it would be easy to just delete that layer. And we're going to do the AI clear. Um, somebody just asked if the brush was feathered. It was a soft brush, so the the softness was all the way down to as soft as it could go. So technically, yes, it was feathered. Um, it was a very soft brush. And we don't need this right now. <laughs> Sorry, this is going to have to pop up and I got to close it and get rid of this. And Okay, <laughs> so that's our AI clear here. And now I'm going to bring in a bokeh texture of mine that's similar to the background, but it's going to add a little bit more bokeh. And this one, we're going to stretch out, hit enter. I'm going to blend this to soft light and bring the opacity back just a little bit, about 80% or so. And now I decided I like this, but I thought Kind of like we did with the truck, I wanted some type of border, but I wanted something different than just a border. So I decided to play with crop shapes. And I there are some built into Photoshop, but of course I like to work with my own designs. And this is one from one of my sets in the store. So all I've done was bring this in. This is also a PNG, so there's a transparent background and it has this shape. And I'm going to rotate and move this shape around to kind of cover the flower and I'm going to stretch it out and I don't necessarily need all of the flower covered but I wanted a good portion of it covered so something like that okay and so I've created that. Oh, I also want to do a merge layer above this. So I'm going to click back to my texture. I forgot to do this. Do the Control Alt Shift E because I want to. Oops, I'm going to kind of turn that off first. Control Alt Shift E. Okay, because what I want to do is clip this picture, which is the whole image, to this shape, so it takes on that shape. So I'm going to take this shape and merge it. Or, move it below our merged picture, click on the picture layer, and do um, Control, Alt, and the letter G. And that's going to group this shape to that layer. And let me turn off the other layer so you can actually see it. So now you can see that our picture is only where that shape is. Okay, so we've grouped those two together. They call it a clipping mask. Um, so now I want to add, let's see, we've merged it, clipped it. I want to add a new blank layer beneath this shape to add a new background into it. So we're going to click add a new layer and that always will add above whatever layer is highlighted, which is why I selected that layer. And I'm going to make my foreground color 798055 and I chose that from within the image as well. And then if we do the alt backspace or option delete, that will fill that layer with that color. And I'm going to reduce the opacity to 50%. And then what I'm going to do is turn back on these layers in the background. And you can see some of the picture now showing through and the, the bokeh and the layer that it was below it. So that would be our finished image. You could, 
if you needed to add a little area to the um, shape, you can modify that by grabbing a brush and just changing it to black. I would probably use something different than a round brush. I would choose something with some texture in it. We're going to get to these in a little bit, but uh, let's try something like that. And if you needed to paint with black on that layer, and I have to rasterize that layer first before let me do that, um, you could, you know, just paint. Let's take this up to 100%, or we're not going to see it. You could see where you could paint a little more if you wanted to change your shape at all. You can modify that, or if you wanted to, like, color in where it, there were some holes in the flower, you could fill that in so you would see more of the flower. So you can change that, you know, as you go along like that as well. Can I turn the brush? Yes, you can rotate brushes, dear. My husband just asked if a question. If you wanted to change the angle of that brush, you would just go to your brush settings, which are under window, brush settings, and you could use this little thing to kind of twirl it around if you wanted to go a different direction. So we can do that as well. Thanks, dear. All righty. Moving right along. It's already 4.30. That's okay. We've gone through three projects, so we're getting there. All righty. So the next project is going to show you how to work with some type on an image. And I'm going to kind of do a, a cheat. I'm going to show you the original file, and then I added three textures to this, and I'm going to kind of jump to one that already has the textures on it, because I've shown you a couple times how to drag textures in, and most of you know how to do that. So I just really want to show you the writing part of this one. So this was my original file. And this was just something I took in the house a couple of years ago. Um, this is actually, this brown is actually scrapbook paper and just a white piece of foam board behind it and window light coming in. So I added three textures and then ended up with this. And in the, the notes, if you get it, you actually get the textures and all. Um, but again, to save time, I really wanted to demonstrate the, the words and how you can modify them on this project. So here you can see I added the green texture. Let's do it this way. We'll do it quickly. We added the green to bring out the green in the bottle, and I masked everything except the bottle. Then we added the sunset, and then I added the brown, and I did a reverse mask and masked it off of the bottle and left it on the background. A merged layer. And then in Topaz, I actually did a lilac wash setting and then did a slight vignette with pink, which is unusual, but it worked for this image just to darken those edges a bit. So now we want to add type. So I'm going to click on the type tool. And once I click in the image, you'll see a new layer pop up. Type is one of those functions that automatically adds its own layer. So first I'm going to choose my typeface for this one. Um, you can favorite a bunch of types and then choose the star to just see your favorites. Otherwise my list is huge and I've got tons of fonts that are not even in here. But for this one I used Eleusius, which is, I have no idea where I got it. I have tons of fonts I've downloaded from different places um, and purchased bundles and, and whatnot. Um, if you get the blog on, Tuesdays I do around the web so when I find new things like that, especially freebies, I put those in there in different bundles. So I want my type to be fairly large and the preset sizes are kind of like standard sizes, but you're not limited to that. You can just erase that and type in the size you want and I'm using a hundred point type. I used to be a typesetter so I'm kind of a type nerd. <laughs> so. Um, and then I'm going to choose my color of my type, and I'm typing in the number that I used before, which was 613731. I knew I wanted it to be kind of a darkish, it's like a reddish brown. And then I'm going to click anywhere on my image, and I'm going to type the word bloom. And then if you want to move it while it's at this stage, you just need to move your cursor to get that move tool. So you're going to be off of the word, and then you can move it into position. 
And now I want to do, use a different font and a different size for the next words. If I changed my font now, it would change this line. And thank you to Pat Rec, who is probably online. She's usually watching my webinars because she told me the shortcut. I was always having a hard time changing my fonts. And the key is before you change the font, hold the shift key and then click where you want the next line to start. And that will add another layer. So now you can change your font and your point size and not change what you've already done. So this one I'm going to use, there's one called Intruding Cat. And I'm gonna make this line smaller. So I want this to be 40 point. And you can always change the point size when you're done and I'll show you how to do that in a second. I'm gonna use the same color and I'm gonna type where you are planted. And I'm gonna move that into place. And this is where I love to work with type because I like to make things like fit into spaces. And that's why I ended up with the size I did because it just worked well for me. Let me move it down just a smidge. Okay, so if I wanted to change the point size, all you have to do is double click in where this letter T is on the layer. And once it's highlighted, you can go up here and change the size and it would automatically change or the color or anything like that. Or if you select that layer and use the move tool, you'll get, <clears throat> excuse me, the bounding box and you can just stretch it any way you want. So you can do that as well. So we're gonna stick with that size. So now the type is there, but to me type like this, I'm gonna zoom in so you can see it better, just looks kind of boring. It looks like it was just kind of plopped on there. I like to give my layers some depth, a little bit of a drop shadow. Um, and so I'm gonna show you how you can do layer styles to add some interest to your type. So I'm gonna double click this first layer over, you need to click like over here in the blank area, not on the thumbnail and not on the name, in a blank area, and that will give you this layer style box. So first thing I wanna do is bevel and emboss. So if you click the check mark, you also have to make sure you highlight that line to get the actual controls in here. And what I wanna change for this one is the depth, if you watch like this, like lighter and darker color, the more depth I give it, the more pronounced that effect is going to be. So for this one, I want it to be at about 125 or so. Yeah, that works, 136. Doesn't have to be exact, as long as it looks good. The size of the, I want the, the uh, direction of the embossing to be up. You can also do down. The size 24 is good and 15 is good for the softening so that it's not just a really hard edge between the lighter and darker area. Then I want to do a stroke and I'm going to use the stroke. Sometimes you want a contrasting color, but because this is such a fine lined font, I thought if I added a stroke, let me get to my next page of notes here. I'm gonna add four pixels. I'm gonna keep it the same color as the type on the outside edge of the type. And you can see how that just thickened up those lines a little bit. So if I go to, I'll show you again, zero, we have a much narrower type. And then four, it kind of fattened that up a little bit. All right, we're gonna leave blending mode and all that alone. And then we're gonna do the drop shadow. And for this one, we're going to use an angle. Uh, I like to use like 135 for my angle because it gives it a nice, you know, from the upper left lighting um, direction. Distance, and this stuff you're just gonna play around with and it's actually remembering um, what I did earlier for some of this. So distance 15, Spread, I did 34%, size 51%, and then the opacity, 32 is good. So I just want something subtle. It just gives some separation between the type and the background. 
So now I want to do the, basically the same effect on the other line, but instead of redoing everything, if you click, on, make sure that layer is highlighted, right click over here and go copy layer style, and then click on the other layer, right click, paste the layer style. So now that was, you know, that four pixel stroke is a little too much for that smaller type. So you can just then open it up and go into the stroke and I'm going to change that to one pixel, um, change the shadow, drop shadow to uh, 15, 15 pixels, which it's at, and then the bevel and emboss, change that depth to a little bit less, to about 45 or so, 43. That works. Just so it's more in tune with that particular size of the type. So there would be our finished um, project. Yes, dear, we have a couple of questions. Okay. One about what typeface is that proposed? Okay. It's called Illusius and it is spelled, hold please. Um, I-L-L-U-S-I-A-S -L -L is that typeface. And the other one was Intruding Cat. That's what the other, it's used as Intruding Cat. She also wanted, what, what do they want to know how, you, Go ahead. She wanted to know how you move the type while it's still highlighted. Okay, how did I move the type while it was still highlighted? Good question. Um, so I'll double click it. When the type is highlighted like that and you want to move it, you can't click in the middle. You want to move your cursor off of the type until you get that arrow with the plus sign. That's the move tool, and then you can move it around. If I clicked in here, it would put me in the middle of the line. The other way is if you use the move tool, then you can click in the middle. So you, you, now that I have the move tool, I can actually click here and move it. But if it's highlighted, you have to be off of the type to get it to move. So good question. And that makes sense with what we're doing to answer that now. All righty, let's move on. So we're going to close this guy and close this one. All right, so now I'm going to show you how to create a texture of your own using brushes that are built into Photoshop. And we did this a couple webinars ago in webinar eight. So we're going to start with a new blank layer. So file, new, and I have a size custom set because I use this all the time. Do you want to be 15 inches by 15 inches or something pretty large like that? 300 pixels per inch because that's always what I have my images at. And you want the background to be white. I use RGB color and 8-bit is fine for a texture. You don't have to do a 16-bit here and just say create. And everything we're going to do here, we're going to do on separate layers and I'll show you why in a second. So I'm going to hit a new blank layer and I'm going to grab a brush and these brushes are built into Photoshop and I'm going to show you at the end of this project how to get some more brushes for free from Adobe. Um, for this one I'm going to use stenciled sponge dry. So I'm going to double click that. I'm going to click on my foreground color and because I've done this project before again I'm going to type in the number so I can replicate it. We're going to work with different shades of tan. And I want to make the brush size way bigger or I'll be here for a week <laughs> typing it. I'm going to make it 1700 pixels. And I'm just going to start stamping. And you don't want to overlap it a lot, but you want it to cover the area, you know, cover the whole area, including the edges pretty well. And that's our first layer. Now, when I create textures, I like to work with usually three layers to give it some depth. So we're going to add another blank layer. I'm going to change my brush. Sometimes I use the same brush and just change the size, but this one I decided to change it to Sea Sponge 1. I'm going to change my color to something a little bit darker. I usually start lighter and then go darker. 634. And the other thing you can do so that you're not stamping the same pattern, I also want to be at 1400 pixels, sorry. And I'm using my bracket keys, which are the square brackets to the right of the letter P to make my brush bigger or smaller. The left one makes it smaller and the right one makes it bigger. We're gonna go into those brush settings um, 
So you can, I have it docked over here, but you would just go to window brush settings and we can um, change how this brush reacts. So it will vary the way it stamps on the canvas. So the first thing I wanna change is shape dynamics. And we're gonna change the size jitter. So that means it's gonna fluctuate size a little bit. And you can see at the bottom how this is changing. And then the angle jitter is 30. So it's gonna rotate the brush automatically as we stamp. Then we click on scattering. The same thing with the layer styles. You need to click on the actual layer to get the controls over here. We're gonna go scatter about there. And the count jitter, oops, wrong one. Count jitter to like 17%, 18%. And then if you want to also fluctuate the color a little bit, you can go into color dynamics and choose change the saturation. It's already at 13, which is where I want it. But you can also change the hue if you wanted to change colors more. So we'll close that. And now you're going to see the brush actually rotating as I stamp. And I like to be fairly random with these. You don't really want a solid you know, consistent pattern. So I usually try and click around and that's layer two. And because this layer was so much darker than the other, I actually decided to bring this layer under the first one. So you could see a little bit more of that light color on top of it. And that's another way you can kind of play with these is to rotate and drag layers up and down. And then the third, um, color is going to be 614F18. And I'm going to change my brush again to C Sponge 2. And we're going to make this one 1200 pixels. And again, I'm going to um, adjust my settings. So I'm going to go to the shape dynamics change my size jitter and the angle there. and then scattering oh, let's scatter I'm gonna go much higher this time about 400 percent okay and then another trick when you're stamping if you can't quite see if you've covered in layer, especially when you have this much color, temporarily just turn off the visibility of the first two so that you only can see this layer. And now you can see that you've, you know, covered the area that you want to cover. And some brushes are going to cover more of the canvas than others. If you get an area that's like too dark, you end up something too heavy, you can just undo a stroke or two and, you know, fix that as you go along. So you want to be fairly consistent, but it doesn't have to be perfect. It, you know, the more random it can be, the better. And get our corners. Alrighty, so that's our third layer. We can turn the other two back on. And again, I decided because this was so much darker, I'm going to bring that under layer two. And that would be a finished texture. So you, what you always want to do first is save it as either a TIFF or a PSD file to keep these layers, and I'll show you why in just a second. And then you're going to save it again as a JPEG because that's what you'll need to drag into your um, image to use it as a texture. Now we can save it like this with the white background. We can also click on our background layer, add another uh, color, uh, just a transparent layer. And I'm going to choose color C2D07A, a much lighter brown. And I'm going to fill this layer with that color with all backspace. Now that's a little too dark. So by having the white layer underneath, we can bring back that opacity. And it won't become transparent because we have that white underneath of it. So you can save that now as is and as a again as a TIFF file and then as a JPEG to use. So now say we really love this texture and we want it in green instead of brown. We can change these layers without having to re-stamp them all. So I'm going to turn off 
these three for a moment and highlight this layer. And we're just going to change our color. And let's see, where did I have this number. So F5, FA477. So we're going to work with greens. Now remember, we did this before. We're going to hold the shift key when we do the alt backspace, and that will only apply the new color to where the pixels already hold color. Change our color again. 387C50. And we're going to turn on the second layer, highlight it, shift alt backspace. Turn on the third layer, highlight it, change our color, 1E5331, shift alt backspace. And then we're also going to change our background color to a light green, 759E84. And now we don't need to hold the shift, I'm just going to do the alt backspace. And then you can um, adjust the, oh, tr yeah, the transparency or opacity as much as you want. And yes, this is all is in the notes, dear. So you can create a whole library of textures based on, um, you know, just one that you've stamped. You could create a whole library of different colors. So now if you wanted to get some new brushes from Photoshop for free, if you click on the arrow next to the where you would select your brush and go into your brush menu. Go up to this little gear wheel in the upper right and down to where it says get more brushes. And it will take you right to the Adobe website. And as soon as it finishes loading, all of these brush sets are available to download for free. So if you wanted to do, say, the summer release one, just click download and it's going to go into your download folder. And I think it's hiding on me here. The download? Hmm. I don't know if it downloaded. I can't see it. I think my toolbar is in the way. Let me, uh, let's see if it's there. So let's go back to Photoshop. Once you've downloaded it, go back to this menu, back to the gear wheel and say import brushes. So whether it's these that you've downloaded or brushes you buy from me or from anybody else, um, and then you're going to go to your downloads folder. And it didn't download, but here's another set that I did download. So spatter brushes, this was one of the Adobe sets that were there. I downloaded the other day. Just double click it. And if you scroll to the bottom of your brush menu, there it is. And you can see there are a bunch of brushes in these files. There are a huge amount of brushes. So you can download some new stuff and play around and create some more textures and all kinds of cool stuff for yourself. Alrighty, we're getting down there. Oh, not too bad, 504. So we won't go too much over, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. Um, okay, so let's close this guy. And you can also, oh, let me show you one other thing. Let's do a merge layer. Control Alt Shift E. You can also now take these into Studio. And I like to use Impression to then create a new texture from the ones you've already created. So if you go to Add a Filter and down to Impression, I just happen to like it because it's a very painterly look. You know, pick a brush. Um, and then come down and just start making adjustments. You can go, let's say, a high number of brushes, opacity, stroke rotation, and you can see how it's changing as I start clicking around, and I'm just doing this really quickly to give you an idea. You can smudge it a little. So you could create even more versions based on that. Abstraction is also another good filter you can add. That's like a simple, the old simplify, because it even has a simplify size. So if you wanted to even give it more of a painterly look, you can do all this kind of stuff and really do some cool stuff in there. So don't be afraid to play around. I always tell people you can't break things if you don't like it, you just delete it. Not a problem. Um, so no. So I'm going to show you the first project I did this past summer, when I kind of rediscovered Luminar, I had 
had a beta version when they first um, switched or came out with it for a PC because originally this was a Mac only product and somebody had contacted me and said do you want to try this I'm like sure why not and I never really did a whole lot with it and then I had a few people when I was doing sky replacements by masking and stuff this summer say have you tried Luminar for this because it's so much easier well I was just totally blown away so we're going to filter uh, Skylum and we'll do this one in Luminar 4 and then the next project I'm going to do in the new AI so you can see the difference. Um, I just, when I applied the sky, it was like, this is like the best thing since sliced bread because I've never seen anything that's ever worked this good before to replace the sky. Especially when you've got really thin lines like on this boat and it's great around trees and things like that. So we're in Luminar um, and we're going to go to the creative tab. And that's where you're going to find AI Sky Replacement. And in here, the sky selection, I have imported a whole bunch of my own skies that are in my um, store. But if you go all the way down here, from this line down, from blue sky one here, these all come with the product. For this one, I actually ended up trying one of my own. And it's called red and blue and this is a pretty dramatic sky and in like seconds you're going to see this happen so i'm going to click on that and boom there's my new sky and the other thing that i really love about this is that it also recolors the whole image to match the sky it doesn't just replace the sky and then you can go in and change things even more so if your horizon wasn't quite meeting properly you could change the horizon blending and the horizon position um, i'm actually going to let's try dropping this horizon a little so we can see more of the red up at the top because this is a you know a full image um, sky picture but it you know it chooses where it wants to drop it like it kind of drops the bottom just below the horizon so you can you know play around with that a little bit um, and then you can go into if you wanted to relate the scene even more you know to make it match better you can do that um, if you had gaps between like branches and things you could do the sky um, closed gaps or sky local I don't think I'd wanted to focus my sky, but I guess there are times you might want to. You can also flip the sky if you needed to match the angle of light. So let me show you. So you can flip it around um, horizontally. You can add haze. You can change the temperature, the exposure. So if you wanted to brighten it a little bit, you could do that. You can also add a mask if you need to. So there's lots of cool things that you can do in here. Then you could also, all in, in the same creative seg section, there's also AI augmented sky. And what this does is it actually gives you some objects you can place in your sky, like birds and clouds and fireworks. And let's try birds too, just so you can see how it works. And then what you do is click on place object and that will give you a bounding box and now you can move them and resize them you can rotate them or eh, resize them so you can move them around wherever you want it to be um, there's quite a lot of birds in this so you may want to even move it up so a few of them are kind of off the page which you can do as well you can add sun rays you can um, dramatic just kind of boosts some of the colors and things and the contrast you can do the matte look which is not my favorite um, mystical kind of gives it i don't know just a, a kind of deeper tone and all of these have advanced settings and and then color styles which are lookup tables are basically like presets where you can change the whole color scheme of the image with some of these um, cross-processing and there's some base towards portrait training uh, portrait toning and then you can add textures as well you can load a texture right into here but you can only do them one at a time there's not a library in here so i would probably not do my textures here 
and then glow, which is similar to the topaz glow. You can add a little hint of glow. You can just do a ton of things. You can add film grain. You can even add some fog if you wanted to. Let's see what we do here. You can add, you know, fog. You can mask it to an area. So there's all kinds of neat things you can do. So that's a really quick um, how-to on that part of Luminar. So let's cancel this. And we're going to do a new photo I haven't done before in a webinar. Um, and no, we don't want to save that. And we're going to open this up into Photoshop because I like to start in my Photoshop first, as I mentioned. Duplicate my background layer. And this is a raw file. I brought it in as a, just saved it as a JPEG just for simplicity in, um, you know, providing with the notes and stuff because raw files are so big. But this has not been edited at all. Um, so I already did the cropping and straightening also on this in previously to make it simpler for today. So we're now going to go into our Luminar Skylum. Let's, we're going to do the new Luminar AI. I've been uh, beta testing this for a couple of months and it's pretty amazing. Luminar 4 was great. This is like, holy moly. <laughs> I love it. And I find myself using it more and more because it just is so great. Ah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about adding your own skies to Luminar at the end, because there's a trick to doing it without having to do them one at a time. And I, I did have it in the blog a couple weeks ago, um, but I will talk about that in just a moment. Thank you, dear. So what Luminar AI does is it's using artificial intelligence. Um, it's extremely smart, and it's a very fast program. So what it does now is, when you open an image in here, it actually analyzes the image to determine what kind of an image is this. Is it a landscape? Is it a portrait? Um, is it a seascape kind of thing? So it will suggest what are now called templates, which are basically like looks, but you can actually still access the old looks, and I'll show you that when we're done with this one. But it will suggest templates as a starting point to edit your image. So this category, urban style, is what it suggested. So I opened that, and then it has these six presets within that collection. And I tried Melbourne, and I liked the way it made the colors pop. And yes, it did look a little blurry just for a second until it kind of focused in. Um, so that's the one we're going to go with for this. But then once you apply a preset, you can also go on and do more editing. So then you're going to go over to the Edit tab up here at the top. And you're going to see this is, looks pretty much like uh, Luminar 4. You've got the same four tabs, the Essentials, Creative, Portrait, and Pro. And the one thing that you'll notice, if you open this as a standalone, there's going to be another little button up here that lets you crop and straighten an image. When you open it from Photoshop, you don't get that button because they're assuming you're going to do that in Photoshop, which is what I prefer. Um, so that's the one thing I noticed uh, when I was playing around with it this week. Um, so you do have the erase tab is just like, um, cl uh, not cloning, but healing. So I decided I wanted to get rid of this power line. So once you open the tab, you're just going to put the brush over the line is going to show as a red line, and then you're going to click Erase. And it's gone. And then if you wanted to, you know, get fancier and maybe missed a little and, and hit that, you can do a couple of spots and then hit Erase, and it's just going to heal those right out. And that works pretty well. Okay. Oh, and, hold on. Yes. Um, somebody asked if Luminar 4 and Luminar AI have the same things. They're similar, but Luminar AI is more than an upgrade to 4. That's why they didn't call it Luminar 5. Because it has all of this new technology, they were not compatible enough to 
just upgrade one to the other because it's a totally different platform. Um, so Luminar AI is a new product, but they have said that they will support Luminar for at least through the end of next year. We've had many webinars for affiliates over the last month, or about a month and a half, um, and they've been pretty specific about that, um, that they are not, you know, just saying, oh, well, Luminar 4, you're on your own. They are going to continue to um, upgrade that for at least a, a year from now. Ouch. Um, but Luminar AI is a new product. It does a lot of the same things, but it's got a lot more functionality than the 4 did. I've, like I said, I've been playing with it for a little bit now, and I'm pretty impressed with it. Okay, so we did erase. So the next thing I want to do is under light, which is where you do your white balancing, temperatures, tint, and all of this fun stuff. Their smart contrast is really good, and there's another contrast we're going to get to in a, a bit that's even better. Um, than anything else that any other product has. And somebody asked too the other day um, with the sky replacement, now that Photoshop has the sky replacement feature, the difference in this one is the way this um, recolors the image better and coming within the first quarter of 2021, they're also going to have a feature added to it where it will automatically um, you can automatically do a mirror image in water, which you cannot do in Photoshop. So they're still working on that. There are a few new things they're going to be adding within the first quarter of uh, 2021. Okay, so smart contrast, I went to 29, right there, highlights, I brought down, shadows, I brought up. So these are similar to other programs, but it's all part of your editing that you can do here. And then you can open up the blacks and whites. And I brought up the whites just a little bit. Then we're going to go to Enhance AI. And any of these functions, when you look at this list, if it has a dot in front of it, that means that something was applied as part of that template that I used, that Melbourne one that I first applied down here. So that something has already been done in that. So as well as in Enhance, it's, it's um, done some of the accent and I decided to up that even a little bit more. Structure, I'm going to add some to here. And then color, I upped the vibrance just a tad. Details. Again, this is like in, in Topaz, I'm going to do a little bit to the small, the medium, and these I actually did a little bit in here too. I left that at 11. And then we have denoise, and the sky was especially noisy, so I brought that up to like 66. And the color denoise there. And then under landscape, I did dehaze, just a couple points. Foliage enhancer is going to enhance your greens. And under advanced, you also have a foliage hue, because this was a little yellowy. So I brought it back just a little bit. And then I went to the creative tab because I'm going to change out that sky. So we're going to go to, now it's called Sky AI. It does the exact same thing um, in here. These are all of my um, selections. And I used one of theirs for this project, Blue Sky 2. And here's where, let's see, horizon blending, that's fine. Horizon position, I brought down a little. I relit the scene, that's good. Sky global, that's good. Under advanced settings, atmospheric haze, I did that. Sky temperature, and sky exposure. there. 
And then under the Pro tab, they have what is now called super contrast. And they said this is better than, like in Photoshop, we have the highlights and shadows, that this is way better than that because it really just changes the contrast and doesn't change the color of your image at all. So I'm going to change my highlights. 25 mid tones, 28, and shadows. And then I went back to my Essentials tab and did the vignette. That's down here. And we're going to go minus 41, just to darken the edges, just a hair. And then we're going to hit this Apply button. That will take us back to Photoshop. And we're going to do a little bit more to this because we're going to make it look like a real vintage image. We're almost done, a few more minutes. Thanks for hanging in with me, everybody. And at the, somebody's saying they don't see the link for today's notes. I will put up the slide at the end. They are available in the store under notes. Yep, it's meredithimages.com slash products. We'll take you to the store. And it takes just a second for everything to populate that we just did. And you can see the before and we'll see the after in just a second. So because we did a lot, it's going to take a few seconds to populate in. There you go. So there's our before, after. And I'm, actually everything I did to this color is kind of going to be for naught because we're going to go in a totally different way. But if you wanted to just perfect the image, we could be done at this point, but I'm going to take it into Studio. So I do like working with multiple products, as you can tell. I think they all have their, their place in the workflow. And I'm going to click on Add a Look. And I'm going to search for, and this one is called Hard Days Night. I'll give that a second to load. Now I love the way this looked on the house. I didn't like the light leaks, but that's okay. We're going to say apply. And you can see there are four textures on here and you can just turn off the eyeball and you'll see what each one is doing. And that was the light leak on the left. And this one up top here is this texture. So we can just turn those off and not have to worry about that. And then I also wanted to add a little bit more of a border to this. So I'm going to click on add a filter and go to my textures and go to the group borders. And I like these because they're just a little different than adding just a plain old vignette. So I use border fade one and I up the opacity to 62. Click accept and go back to our Topaz, um, sorry, back to Photoshop. And one more thing we're going to do, I'm going to bring in another texture of my own to change the color up a little bit. And we're going to change this to soft light and bring it back to about 55%. So you can see before it, so it just warmed it up a little more. It really gave it that vintage -y look. And that would be that. Now, to add your skies to Luminar 4. Uh, like I said, this was in the blog on December 3rd, in the tutorial Thursday, right after the other webinar. But what you would need to do, and I'll bring over my... And this is the Windows way. I have not figured out yet the exact file structure in a Mac, and maybe somebody else can enlighten me. Um, what you would need to do to not have to only bring them in one at a time, you're going to do it here in your menu. So if you go to your PC and then go to your username up top here, which is me, Hazel, 
then under there, you're going to go to your app data. And if that is hidden, you can go in and unhide your hidden folders. Go to roaming. Come on. And you're going to go down to Luminar, whichever one you're trying to put them in. Data. And I'll put this in the blog again. And it's in the notes. And then go to Skies and Custom. And there's all of the ones that I've brought in. These are all my own. The, the Luminar, um, these are some new ones um, that I got from uh, Luminar. And then these others are all mine. So there's a whole bunch of skies in mine because I brought them in this way. And you can just bring in the whole folder at a time. Also in the notes today, I, there's a page at the back of brush resources, um, other places that you can get brushes besides the uh, Adobe site. Um, there's like five sites you can get some free brushes from. Um, of course, I have some in, in my site. And then there's another company called Group Brushes, G-R-U-T. He's from Canada, um, and Nikolai has beautiful sets of brushes at a very reasonable place, price, and I have my affiliate link in there as well. Um, no, not the sea sponge. Those are um, Adobe ones. He did not do the um, ones. The group brushes are great, yes. They're designed for digital painting, um, but I decided to try them to create textures, and he was actually impressed when I showed him what I did. Um, I had emailed him and said, hey, do you know you could do this too? So a lot of my textures, I use his brushes to create. So, phew, um, <laughs> a little bit long, but thank you guys for hanging in there. I appreciate it. Um, so today we are having a year-end blowout sale from now until December 31st. Um, all textures and brush sets are 40% off with the code by 2020 because bye-bye. We'll all be glad to see 2020 out of here. And then the notes with the images and textures again from today's webinar plus a bonus set of six textures are just $5 in the store. Prices are going to be increasing in 2021 on my textures. I think I'm one of the cheapest companies out there from what I've seen that everybody else charges. So I have to up mine just a little bit to kind of keep... Um, okay, we have some questions. All right. I have. All right, let me check the Q&A. So, let's see. To add a texture in L Luminar AR, select the little pen tip and choose texture instead of basic data texture layer. Yes. Thank you, Pat. Um, and we went over that. Is there a way to see the changes before and after in Luminar? Yes, there are. There's that little button up top that um, you can toggle back and forth as well. Will they add the thumbnail in the first qu quarter? Yes. Um, thanks, Martha. Yes, that is another feature. So when you look at the skies, we had that whole list of just the skies. They're going to be adding thumbnails so you can actually see the skies. And that is supposed to be one of the things coming in the first quarter as well. So thanks, Martha. Um, where did you get the sea sponge brushes? Those were part of the legacy brushes in Photoshop. Um, how do you make the transparent PNG file? So if you were creating like the shape, like I did the crop shape, if you um, did a file new and instead of choosing white, chose um, transparent and create, you could take a brush and you could create, you know, whatever shape you wanted and then save, you know, make it black, obviously not green, um, and then just save it and that would become a, you know, save it as a PNG when you do your file save as, because that will keep that transparency. Um, a JPEG will turn the background white, so you'd want to choose PNG to save that transparency. And you can see here's my other swash here and my, my frame brushes. Um, Let's see what else we can answer. Should I be seeing the image of you? No, I didn't have my camera on. <laughs> Sorry, you're just, you just, I just do what I'm working on. You don't need to see me. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so let's say we had anything over here. Um, thanks for all the kudos, everybody. I appreciate that. Um, I will go through these again. I don't see anything really pressing right now, just glancing really quickly. Um, 
but I do print out the questions um, when I when the webinar is being recorded, it, which it is, and it also saves me the chat log. So I will go through them and in Thursday's um, tutorial Thursday blog, I will answer all of the questions that I can again in there and, um, and cover some of these others again about like bringing in um, skies and things like that and, and adding some brushes. So I thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. If you're celebrating Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. Uh, Merry Christmas to those who are celebrating that soon. And all of the other holidays around this time of year, please have a wonderful season and a happy and healthy new year.